I am Colin Hambrook, editor of Disability Arts Online. I'm an older white male wearing glasses and a lockdown beard. Welcome to the second artist presentation in our series of events responding to the current situation caused by the coronavirus outbreak. In the second in our series, an insight into the Noble Sage, Jana Manuel Pillai, director of the Noble Sage Art Collection, an art dealership specializing in Indian, Sri Lankan, and Pakistani contemporary art, discusses how he chooses work, shares tips for artists, and describes how his own disability impacts and drives his art collection. In the film, Jana Manuel Pillai is sitting in his office and occasionally pulls out artwork that is propped close to his seat. He is a South Asian man with dark rimmed glasses wearing a light shirt. Send your questions for Jana to answer in the Q&A section via the Facebook or YouTube comment sections or the hashtag DowCovidCommissions. So now I'm going to hand you over to Jana and I'll see you again at the end for the Q&A section. Hi, my name is Jana Manuel Pillai. I am the director of the Noble Sage art collection. We started in 2006 and we specialize in Indian, Sri Lankan and Pakistani contemporary art. Uh, we have been going now um, since 2006, so 14 years. We used to have an actual physical space but now I work online having pop-up exhibitions say four to five per year uh, where I invite my clients and I have them come and see work. I write a catalogue, I do all parts of the gallery. And so I've been told by Disability Arts Online that there are many artists out there who would love to know tips on how to approach an art dealer. And that's what I'm gonna be talking about today. I hope it's of use to you today. So today I would probably like to start by talking about why Disability Arts Online got in touch with me um, and why they're commissioning me for this, for this piece. Um, about um, now 20 years ago, I developed an eye condition called retinitis pigmentosa, which is a degenerative eye condition, which brings the peripheries in um, until right now, over 20 years, it's brought the peripheries in until mainly all I see is really in the center. So I have central vision and nothing else. So I can't see anything outside of here. Um, that is kind of um, something that has impacted me as an art dealer in simple ways. For example, in how I move artworks around, um, I, if I'm close to a large artwork and I'm moving it, I can't see the, the edges uh, if, I'm look if I'm in the middle of it. Um, similarly, if I am looking at an artwork on the wall, if it's a large artwork with, with detail, I take much less in. Um, um, from, a, a, from a midway point, I have to stand back and then I lose detail. So I have to come in for the detail and go back to see the whole work. Now, because otherwise I'm seeing it in small parts all the time, like almost serializing an artwork as I look at it. So that's kind of, um, those are ways that it impacts my work. Um, it also, coming to terms with my own eye condition, made looking for um, artwork that was uh, that showed um, elements of vulnerability or fragility, something that related to the human experience and uh, the human condition became extremely important to me uh, when I look at art and what I'm looking to source for my gallery. And that I think directly relates to my eye condition, the way that my, eye, my eyes deteriorating uh, made me feel more fragile, more at risk, uh, more in danger. And therefore what I source, when I look for art to source, I am naturally looking for that to be mirrored in the work, often, often looking for that to be mirrored in the work that I'm um, interested in, in showing. So those are some three ways. A, a key thing that I would like to say in terms of my eyesight um, and its impact is that it's a huge driver for me. Um, for, for being an art dealer. It's kind of seeing as many beautiful things sh and then sharing those beautiful things with people who trust my vision or trust my taste um, is directly next to 
the 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 depreciation of my eyesight so as my eyes eyes are getting worse my love of art and my need to my urgent need to share it is only ever increasing and so it is a driver for my work as an art dealer another thing that uh, how my eyesight impacts me i guess is how um even though technically i see less than most people because my peripheries are uh, very poor um, on the other hand um, what I do see is extremely clear and I'm, uh, I absorb more than a lot of people and particularly when I meet with artists I think I'm absorbing a lot of what the artist is about how the artist the character of the artist the personality elements of ego or um, of selflessness or kindness in the artist that stuff is important to me I think I'm buying the artist as much as I'm buying the art when I'm um, when I'm deciding to promote an artist so that's kind of important I think that also relates to my disability because it's just kind of looking for um, you looking for people sure professional art professional kind of looking artists but also who um, treat others well and reflect my own kind of values back at me. Choosing work is, I know something, um, lots of artists out there will be wondering how to get an art dealer or art gallerist interested in their work so that they can get promotion or support of a gallery. I know it's hard, I know it, it must be really hard. Um, uh, in term, I can only speak in terms of myself and um, I look before I talk about tips for the artist, I can tell you exactly what I look for. So I, I have to have artists that are Indian, Sri Lankan or Pakistani. That's crucial for me. That's kind of the, the premise of my, my gallery. It's the, uh, the focus of my gallery. And when I say that, it's primarily 90% of them artists living in India, Sri Lanka and Pakistan. Now, having said that, there are a few artists that live here who have that background or that heritage, uh, their second generation maybe, or they were born there and they moved here. And I, I always will look at work if it falls largely into that remit. If you're a non-Asian artist, non-South Asian artist, and you are interested in me supporting the work, well then um, I would be looking naturally for work that's going to connect with my audience who are either India files or they um, or they are South Asian themselves so for me it's really important that the work if you want it to come be supported by me that's what I'm going to be looking for also practically speaking there are certain things that are just they're quite boring but they're practical reasons for me sometimes going for certain works of art over others one of them is the fact that I mainly show uh, works on paper or works on canvas or maybe works on board so that's kind of a really important thing if you look at my collection you won't see works on aluminium or uh, you won't see on, on photographic paper generally it's it, they are nine out of ten works are all paper or canvas pieces the other thing is another practical uh, practical element which is that I look for a particular size as soon as works start being very, very big, they become hard to store. They become hard to transport, um, hard to pack. So I look for works that are easy in those respects, but also easy to place in my clients' houses. Most of my clients are domestic buyers, so they don't have, the average London house doesn't have huge amount, huge walls. Most of them don't. And I'm not in that kind of that level that I, I need those huge works for huge houses. Generally speaking, works that are not too big, uh, not too small, are an optimum size. Let me give you an example. So, um, in terms of height, I would say this is a good size. Um, it's a, it's a, it's. I think this is fine it's it's not too big um, it's probably about maybe three feet tall or two and a half feet tall um, no probably about three feet tall this is this is a good height in terms of width I would say 
in terms of a landscape work, I would say that this piece is a great width, maybe a little bit too wide actually, maybe this would be fine up to here, but this is a, you know, a very typical size in my gallery and very popular. It sits easily above a um, mantelpiece, uh, above a fireplace, sorry, and you know, it's, um, that's a lot of the spots that I'm, people want a lovely work of art to sit. So yeah, those are some optimum sizes for you. In terms of pricing, I know this is a hot issue. Um, I, I will normally ask questions like, have, have you sold works like these before? At what prices in the last exhibition? Uh, or what, do you, what kind of price are you looking to get to your hand? The reason why I ask that, and probably every dealer asks, is I'm thinking about well, if I add my commission on that, um, is that going to be a sellable, viable sale to my clientele? And every clientele is different. My clientele, I know the kind of price bracket, it's, is, which is really attractive, is, is kind of 600, 700 pounds to about a grand and a half, is really, really attractive. So I'm looking to put it on the wall for that. And um, so I'm interested in finding out from from artists whether um, that is feasible and if the prices are very high and the, and when it's on the wall it's not going to be um, it's going to be too expensive well I'm probably not going to go with it also it has to be said that any artist that I'm going to take on board into my collection I'm looking for a uniqueness of vision and a consistency in their work and when I say uniqueness of vision, that's really hugely important. I need to look at their work and feel like there is a believable and consistent relationship between the work and the artist, the character, the personality of the artist, and the and the work that's being is is emerging from them. Um, I need to look at the work and I need to feel like it has its own voice, its own unique sound that I can take forward to my client. And so that's really important to me. You can't, it's okay for it to derive things from other places or reference things or mimic other people's styles, but eventually, finally, when it's in front of me, it needs to have its own sense. And that's hugely important. Connected with that is the balancing of something intellectual and something aesthetic in all works that I take on. That's really important to me. It's not enough that it's just a pretty painting. People come to me with landscape paintings or things like that, pictures of dogs or whatever, and I turn them away because that's not what I do. Um, I'm looking for something that balances the aesthetic and the intellectual. The best way to show you is with an example. So, this is a work by artist Francis Ferdinands, who's a Sri Lankan Canadian artist who came to me. Naturally, this immediately attracted me, as it attracts, I'm sure, you. The bright colour, the vibrancy, the energy, the stylistic approach, the mixture of the realistic and the non-realistic, um, the patterns, the design, all of it I responded to very positively. But what really made me turn the corner and want this for the gallery was that it had an intellectual aspect too. And the intellectual aspect related to her own life as a, as a migrant coming to Canada as a, a six-year-old and the experiences she had. And also the migrant experience more widely, more broadly, in terms of using symbols like the frog and the butterfly, symbols of change, as well as symbols of such as vessels and a grenade there to describe the way that the migrant experiences can evolve in different ways. So a lot of you I know are interested in how to approach a dealer or an art dealer or a, um, a gallerist and what to say, how to approach it, how to be prepared. So here are my top tips for exactly that. Number one, Consider yourself and your art as a brand. Um, I know people think it's un unsightly or to talk in those terms in terms of in art, but actually it really helps. If you think about what you're about, what your art is about, and how those things overlap, 
what your art means to you, how your art, uh, what you want your art to mean to people, if you want it to mean anything. Um, think about the, think about, really ask yourself questions to make yourself very self-aware about the, the facets of what that play out in your work um, that are very much you. Because I'm going to be interested in that as an art dealer when you come and sit in front of me. I'm really looking at you as much as your art and I'm thinking uh, how do these go together? Can I sell this product frankly? And so think about yourself as a brand and be honest with yourself and authentic. I'm not looking for people to pretend they're something they're not. But I, I do want them to be authentic and to be transparent and honest about who they're, what they're about, who they are and what their art is. So a good example of how a uh, artist kind of can encompass the brand and become really connected with the work when they're explaining it to me is an artist called Eccentric O. Uh, his real name is Omar. He goes by this alias Eccentric O. A uh, very flamboyant guy, very extrovert, uh, really interesting hair, earrings, flamboyant dresser, you know, really coordinated, bright colours. Um, came from a background in street dance, uh, interested in graffiti, street art. So very, and young naturally, so very youthful vibe about him. Um, and it, he came and sat down with me and we talked about, you know, unusually, we talked about the spiritual art, we talked about meditation, mantras, um, uh, kind of revelations, dreams, psychology, uh, yoga, tantric art. We talked about a lot of different things as well as kind of um, how different religions have different kind of spiritual kind of essence around them. So we talked about this really kind of deep, mature, heavy subject matter, um, having seen a guy that wouldn't necessarily link with that idea with the, with those kind of themes and his work just connected it all together let me show you his work so this is omar's work it's a um it's as you can see you can see that it uses calligraphic script of his own making that has come through researching and studying different scripts of uh, different religions, uh, different cultures. Um, he uses his own name, E-O, Eccentric O, as a kind of tag in the middle of his work, as well as a design feature around the edges. Uh, the work uses silver leaf. He makes the frames himself, as well as the artwork. There was a level of dedication and professionality about Omar. Uh, in his work but then you've got this youthful personality big personality that i knew just i could just sense connected so well with the work and i knew immediately that was a product that was a brand that i could sell and uh, got behind him and we've done really really well together another great example is this young artist priya barrett priya is a uh, an artist who works really interestingly in a disused police station at the time when i met her um, she, she was in a disused police station and uh, working there she played, she has decks in the, in the space so she plays music real loud as she works and she was a really vibrant, youthful uh, and genuinely young artist, I can't remember how old she was, 33 or something like that, um, very young to look at but yeah her work was very, um, the way she talked about herself and her interests was very mature. She was a vegan, a very outspoken vegan, um, and an environmentalist, someone concerned about society. Um, and uh, yeah, but at the same time, um, it had this kind of very, very interesting kind of craft that she was working on, which are these very childish looking paintings of animals. And she uses the animals to tell proverbial tales that were, that kind of teach the viewer things about themselves or teach the viewer things about um, humankind and what, how we need to get better. And so a work like this, for example, is about a rare bird that is now extinct, but at one point was going to be the national bird of, of India. And then it fell to the wayside and, and, be, and now is falling into extinction. So it became a story about um, the way we look after species and the way we, we 
take care of the world around us. So you've got this personality who really cares about the world and you've got work that kind of sung together. Um, and yeah, she's another artist who's done really well with me and, and um, yeah, she, she really encompasses a full and thorough brand. One thing I would say as well as a tip, I guess, is that I think a lot of artists are very nervous about talking about their work. Not all artists are very good at it or um, it doesn't come naturally to them. And I kind of respect that, really. The, uh, as a dealer, as the gallerist, it's my job to really articulate, uh, be a conduit for the artist's vision for their work. Um, so I don't expect artists to be able to talk about their work. All I do expect is for artists to really know their process, how they create their work, as in the technical aspect of the stages that make up a work. I will prize out or, or, or kind of um, filter out the other things that I need to know to make that interesting for, the, for my audience. But I just need to know the process, the physical process of making the work. This is a good example of an artist uh, like that, Anoma in Sri Lanka. We met now 10 years ago or something and um, Anoma really is very, very shy. She, she, she's a shy artist who doesn't like speaking about her work and I love speaking about art that I love and, um, and we got on really well and I kind of interviewed her and got to know her uh, and know how she worked. She just told me the process of how she layers paper and makes marks and, and how, what she uses to inspire her. And I, I did the rest, really, and I, I became kind of a, a voice piece in the nicest possible way for Anoma, which she really likes working with me because I, I know what her interests are and her focus. So my point is, don't be worried about not being able to talk about your work. Um, just, just be all very concerned about knowing your process, knowing exactly physically how you paint. That's what I would like to know. Um, so if, as this is particularly being aimed at artists with disabilities or that um, consider themselves disabled, um, one thing I would say in relation to that, and you have to take into account that I have a disability myself, um, I really respect artists that are open uh, about their disability uh, at, when they're meeting with me and they, and because I think that those things really feed into work always. Um, in some positive way, they, they feed into the, the artwork and the, the, the piece that's created. And I think it's, it's important to know that, just like I was talking to you before about how, how I choose work for my gallery is, is kind of, uh, a res is related to my eye condition, retinitis pigmentosa. Similarly, if someone is hard of hearing or if they are in a wheelchair, um, it, there, that will be impacting the process in some way. And I love to know how. I mean, I think that's an important part of fleshing out that artist for the viewer. When I, when I meet, when I show the work to audiences, I want to really flesh that artist out. And, um, you know, I, I think it's an important thing. So what I would say is be transparent, and be honest about those things. I know it's not easy. I've gone through a similar process myself. I know it's not easy, but I think that it's being honest really about your work and all, all the aspects of yourself that feed into that work. The days of artists uh, just having to think about creating work and being an artist are sadly long gone, I've got to be honest. Um, today, a dealer, when an artist comes to a dealer such as I, is, the dealer is going to be heavily swayed if you've put some work into, into creating a network, creating a list of contacts, creating a, a list of buyers, anything that an artist can bring to the table with his work is going to be welcomed. Because if you think in London, especially the amount of different uh, things grabbing people and so on, their attention, uh, the, more where, the more people that I can contact on top of my own audience, to tell about your work and use my gallery's influence to sell the artist's work, the better. So if you come with a, say, an Excel file or a Word file with all 
names of people that have bought your work or have been interested in your work or influencers or even people with goodwill towards your work that's going to be useful for me as well just be more people to to get there to the to spread the word i, I think that's really really useful um also uh social media naturally is, if you have an active social media account that i can go online and see and see oh you have this many followers this many likes and active as well people are commenting and, and being positive that's obviously going to be look good for me as well um because that's going to be attractive because i can then tag you in works i can at you in works i can use hashtags to generate more and more momentum to your work on my site you see the the artist is going to do well by having a gallery supporting them they're going to look great they're going to look even better kudos level goes up and so i just want to make the most of that so if you have social media a good social media game that's going to be attractive to me the other thing is press. I guess if you've got a press list, uh, you know, people who have written about you before, they're likely to write about you again. And that's always good. I mean, uh, you know, I'm a one man band, so I do everything. And if I ever, I send to my press list, but if you have a few that already know your work, I'd happily send my press release to them as well. And then there's more people likely to cover it. So it's collaborative. I wish it was just about the artists doing their job and creating art, but it's not really. The best artists on my books are the ones that I collaborate closely with. I'm talking to them about their art. They're creating great work, but they're helping me with their clients. They're telling me, get in touch with this person. I think you'll be interested. That, that's the best relationships that I have. The next thing uh, that I would say a top tip is that try and uh, demonstrate in the way that you pack your work when you bring it to show me that you value your work. If, you, if, if you've packed it well, it seems obvious, but if you've packed it well with tissue paper, with a strong, good tube, um, you know, framed it well, if you've framed it, mounted it well, if you've mounted, mounted it, if you look after your work, I'm going, it shows an artist that values their work. And if they, if the artist values their work, well then, you know, I'm going to take greater care over it. I'm going to pay more attention to it. I'm going to focus in more. And, and you know, just think about that when, you're, when you meet with a dealer or with a gallerist. Think about how you present it, you know, so that work. Sometimes artists have come out with canvases. They're like front to front, wrapped together, newspaper in between. It just looks bad. It just looks really bad. And, um, and, it, and it, you know, it just it just makes me think I don't want to deal with this work if it's not valued by the artist why should I value it here's a really good tip if you're approaching a gallery uh, research that gallery research the uh, understand the dealer research the gallery and the collection try and work out what's their focus what kind of work are they interested in um, and why and then go in with that in hand in an email or in person don't go in blind so many um, say photographers and printmakers have got in touch with me and said oh I'd like to show at your gallery you know would you be interested they might be Indian they might be Sri Lankan and Pakistani but they do photography and printmaking and I haven't ever sold a photograph or print in my gallery so even a cursory look at my collection or the mission statement on my website will tell you that I'm not interested in photography and printmaking. Um, but just say they do come in still, they think the photography is good for it. That's fine. But then come in thinking about how you've got your photographer. I don't show photography. Why should I show it? What, what's, what, what is this going to do for my collection? How is it going to broaden my collection? How is my audience going to come on this journey with me? And, and by photography when they haven't done it before. Ask those simple questions and come with those answers for me. And then I can see, I can think in my head, has he got a point, has she got a point, um, and make the decision to go forward or not. As an add-on to that, um, don't send blanket emails to all the galleries on, on some list that you've found on LinkedIn or whatever. Don't send blanket emails. It doesn't make sense, obviously, for the same reasons I've just been talking about. If you send a blanket email saying to whom it concerns or to, you know, some dates, 
it takes five minutes to get, get my name or to get the name of my gallery. These blanket emails get deleted immediately. They don't even, they don't get read. It's a waste of time. And if if you, if there isn't the time to even find the galleries that are most appropriate to your work and research them, um, there you know it would be much better it's time well spent if you just do that before contacting a gallery. Also, another tact is to rather than research the gallery, research the actual dealer, the person who runs the gallery. Even a quick skirt around the internet, you'll find that many different things about me and my, and my personality. You can find out that I collect religious art uh, or religious artifacts and you can find out that I'm well traveled, I like traveling around the world. Um, you can also find out that I collect Batman memorabilia and have done for a long, long time, like 25 years. So there, use that, what you know of me, to approach me. If your art is inspired by comic books and pop art, um, you can say, I know that you collect Batman memorabilia. My work is very inspired by comic books, if it is, or it's very bright like a comic book. I thought you might like it. Things like that make me feel good, like someone's actually done some research. I would really think about that as well as researching the gallery, research the person who runs the gallery. I think uh, also it's very worth um, thinking about as much as you can, I know this is hard, but thinking about the audience for a collection such as mine. Uh, who do you envision the buyer would be looking at my gallery website and looking at the work that I collect? Is, is it banks? Is it, um, you know, uh, premium clients all around the world? Is it a domestic marker? Is it an international marker? Is it generally English people or what, like white English people? Is it South Asian people? Like what is my audience and what have I, what does my collection say about the kind of things that they like to buy from me? Um, before you approach me, if you have a think about that, that can be useful too. So an, an, another thing I would say is if you're coming to a meter dealer or a gallerist and you're having a one-to-one -one with them, um, to park your ego and just come human and honest and, 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 and uh, come ready to listen um, and um, on a level. Um, I've had very arrogant artists come and meet with me and it's off-putting. I can work with anyone that I want to really. Um, within reason if I want to work with them I can I can choose to so if you come as someone I'd like to have business with or you know do work with come as you know that that would be obviously best um, you know in the end galleries such as I um, such as me is uh, we're interested in artists who are dedicated to their craft um, dedicated to their art and um, show commitment and honesty and so come ready to show that really as much as possible. Finally, we get to this quite boring subject of the biodata um, that you come with. Obviously come, obviously come with the biodata to show the exhibitions you've had when you were born, where you studied, those kinds of things, qualifications, awards, grants, all that stuff is great. Bibliographies, uh, journals, anything where you've been published in, any news articles, all that stuff in that same biodata is useful. Now, I've noticed some patterns in terms of what I look for uh, in biodata. Firstly, I look for an artist that from the moment they decided to be a professional artist, and they might have another job, but they've decided to be a professional artist, I want to see progression and constant work. So if you decide two shows a year, well then there's two shows a year from that point on, or one show a year. But I like to see, I don't like to see gaps uh, in a biodata. I like to see progression and I see shows developing and, and someone having a mixture of group shows, a mixture of group and solo shows, you know, um, thematic shows, um, as well as exhibitions that perhaps if possible, a, a corporate has um, sponsored it or a, a restaurant has sponsored it. I like to see that kind of entrepreneurship it rings well for me, like it's, it's attractive. Um, if your work has been bought by a, a company or by, by international buyers, then it's nice to see some names and some company names that I've got behind you. 
Um, and uh, yeah, a full biodata that has that kind of has variety and no real year gaps, you know, that shows consistency is very attractive to me as a dealer. I hope that these tips for artists have been really useful to you. Um, I look forward to your questions um, in the following little bit of time that the Disability Arts Online are, are giving for you guys to ask questions of me. I'll be happy to answer them for you and I look forward to hearing from you. your own disability, um, but also honestly in terms of, you know, encouraging your, your artists to be open about yeah. their, their work. And, um, and I, I wondered um, if, if there were, if you had any further thoughts about encouraging artists to, to speak in an accessible language to, yeah. Well, I mean, I mean, I think um, yeah, it's it's mainly a really auth authenticity that's the key, uh, the key kind of component, I think. And I think it's it's a tricky one for people. They're not all. It's for artists approaching a dealer to be completely kind of transparent about what they're about, and even have the kind of ability to be apart from themselves and look at themselves, their art. And what they produce and why how their character and their personality is connected uh and interwoven with the artwork but i think it's really important i mean um my my own disability retinitis pigmentosa um is really very important very intertwined with uh my gallery and my vision for my gallery um it's uh, materially physically uh, connected with how i see work how I visually see it and how I choose it. Um, but also I think that the, the values of the gallery reflect my own values for art and for the work that I show. And so I try to be very authentic about it. I mean, I um, a long, long time ago, um, early on in the gallery's life, um, I was kind of found it difficult to talk about I guess I was coming to terms with my own eyesight um, depreciating and my own kind of um, weaknesses around my eyesight um, and um, over time I've seen it it's become a strength actually it's become as I say in the video um, become a really a big part kind of a way of um, showing the focus that I have they're not not everyone does have and I think that to talk about the gallery and to overlook an important factor in how uh, how I am and what what drives me um, would be to not be transparent and um, so similarly when artists approach me uh, whatever their temperament be uh, be honest about that temperament and be authentic about it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think there's a way of being dishonest in that circumstance. It's not about that. It's just about authenticity. Yeah. Mm. And we, we have a, a couple of questions from yeah. from uh, our viewers here. Um, f firstly, um, could you tell us a bit more about why and how you became a, an art dealer? Oh, great. OK. Um, yeah, I guess I don't talk about that in the video. Um, so I um, have always been into painting and drawing. So when I um, when I did my degree, um, it was either I was going to be an artist or I was going to be become moved towards becoming 
an art dealer or an art historian. And so I did art history at university and I did um, uh, art history in English and I kind of enjoyed writing about art and learning about art. And I went from there pretty much with, you know, in one line, I moved from there into museum jobs in education and curatorial and then continued in education and curatorial. And then finally, my, pre my last job now, 15 years ago, was at the Mal Galleries, where I was head of education and where I curated exhibitions as part of that. Um, and then uh, after that, it was then that I, I left to set up my own commercial gallery. And that was in 2005 or something like that. And in 2006, I set up the Noble Sage. So I'm like one of those rare people that have had quite a straight path, you know, from A-levels really, um, A-levels, degree in art history, museum work, and then commercial gallery work. It's fairly direct. I've done all kinds of things along the way though, um, fundraising, marketing, um, a, a little bit of um, um, kind of, um, a, a little bit of kind of, other little side jobs really as I go along in the museum as you do in museums but yeah curatorial and education has been constantly a main part I think that's what makes me different from a lot of dealers is that educational aspect mm -hmm. um, even now education is very important to me um, I, I take work into I take work from my collection into schools and I do workshops there um, and so I teach wow. from it it's a very active part of my perspective on on art and how right it right so. uh there's another question that f follows quite nearly from that which is um to ask you about the work that you do within community settings um okay I, I, and i, I kind of connected with that ar around disability as well um yeah some of it i mean i i work with um um, the Noble Sage for the for about five years running has worked closely with uh, the village school in in Brent, which is a, a school for children with severe um, disabilities of many different sorts, very severe in some cases. And so I've been that's where I've been doing a lot of my education workshops, taking work in and providing a providing a kind of a a, a semi art history and then a practical workshop inspired by the work that I brought into their classroom. And so I'm not working from slides, I'm working from sometimes 6,000 pounds worth of art that they've got, the kids have got around them in their classroom, which they've never seen before. So it's, I try to provide something that's special for them um, and that they can, that will inspire some great work from them. And I make sure that the, the activities are something that they can do. I've also worked with an organization called, um, called Action, Action Space. Um, do you know Action Space? I've heard of them, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so they work with, they have a group of artists that have been returning to their space and working there. They're all artists with different types of disabilities. And um, those artists return there week on week to work in that, in that space. Um, I was volunteering there. I did some work for them as well, but volunteering um, there as well. Okay. And um, I've loved Great that. space. Oh, I've loved it. I've loved it. And such interesting work and, and interesting artist perspectives there by, um, that I really enjoyed learning about. And I gained a lot from that experience. Mm. So I, I, another question that's come in that kind of follows from that, from, from uh, having had quite a breadth of experience, was, is really around if you think there might be a potential audience of buyers um, with an interest in in disability as as a as a common theme within oh that's really work that artists but, presents so like um, you mean a, a group of buyers looking specifically for artists who have disabilities mm -hmm. yeah that's really I, I, and work that that maybe reflects um exactly. the, you the know, experience um, that's a really good question i i I'm, I'm not sure. I, uh, my instinct tells me that in the end, it comes down to whether the work's good. That's, that's in the end, that's the bottom line. Is the work good? Um, if, if we assume the work is good um, and the, the work that's 
inspired or reflecting uh, the disability of the artist comes through um, and yet doesn't exclude the viewer because it comes through, you know, in such a way that it's it it, it doesn't it, it's not inclusive enough. It's like my Asian work, like the work in my gallery. So I've got South Asian contemporary art, but very few of those works are very, very. Uh, um, what's the word? They're very all indirectly South Asian. Like often, you can't tell that they're coming from the Asian subcontinent. It's like uh, it's discreet in the work. Often, not always, but often. Similarly, um, if there were if there were uh, artworks by artists with disabilities, and the work came through as high quality work, and this was another aspect of the artist, their disability was one other aspect that made this work interesting. Absolutely, I don't see why. Mm -hmm. I would. I mean, I would love to have um, that kind of thing, like a team. Um, maybe not a team because that separates them out from separates this group out from the rest of my artists but certainly I would happily have a group as long as the work is good in the end it comes down to that but yeah I don't see why not I don't see why not so, through through your talk you um you pointed out artists who who whose work you've kind of gone on a journey with and you you, you spoke quite frequently about going going on a journey um, yeah. and yeah uh, I, I I wondered at what point do you decide this is an artist I, I can go on a on a journey with who, who's whose um, work I, I I can I can sell and mm -hmm. we can build up a rapport I think um you know it's like it's kind of comparable to friendships you know you you have a natural rapport with some people and with others you don't and with business um it's an extension of that feeling but it, normally it's in the first or second or third meetings and viewings of the work of the artist where i'm getting deeper and deeper into understanding what the artist's about the character of the artist how that interrelates with the work itself it's in those three meetings that normally it occurs to me that um, that there's legs in this, that the, you know that there's potential mm -hmm. for a business relationship and for a um, a kind of a, a the, I can normally sense that there's a normally some kind of mutual respect. I respect them, they respect me, and what I'm going to be bringing. There's no jarring. There's no contention. Um, there's kind of a harmony that builds up in those three meetings. And then I feel like, yeah, this is someone I'd want to, I want to promote their work. I like their work. Um, I like them. Um, mm -hmm. And um, and from there, yeah, you take it forward. It becomes the practical things after that. It's, a, it's about margins and, uh, you know, how much it's going to be on the wall and whether I have a buyer for that and, how many of those buyers and are they in the country and have they ever have they bought anything like this from me before and if not would they consider this mm. it becomes those practicalities so it's, it's led to some extent by your knowledge of your own client yes. base exactly mm. basically a dealer is useless without without that I, I, in this day and age with all the all the websites and all the ways that you can sell work and promote your work yourself as an artist mm -hmm. um the key th the key value that i bring as a dealer dealers bring is is the mailing list the ability to be a conduit the ability to be a mediator mm -hmm. um it's our the art historical kind of context you can bring maybe the interpretation the perspective and that mm -hmm. ability to relate to the ar artists on this side and then relate to the client on this side mm -hmm. uh, in a very different group, and um, and um, and so yeah, knowing my clientele, knowing my audience and my buyers is crucial. It's absolutely it's crucial to what the gallery does. Mm. Mm. And a, another question that's come come through from YouTube is, um, what what sort of consignment agreement do you? 
do you strike with your artists? What kind of contracts do you? It's um, it depends on the artists and the nature of the work. Um, normally, it's it's like sixty forty or fifty fifty. That's my that's the normal thing. But it the, it's never it's not always as clear cut as that because um, there's gambles involved with every certain artist. For example, mm -hmm. if I've sold a lot of a certain abstract artist and then a new abstract artist comes that has a lot of a lot of synergy with that one that was well selling really well well then i feel the gamble often is not as big as introducing a whole an artist with a whole new medium mm. and a always very young and hasn't got a name yet or um has a has a particularly large scale of mm -hmm. working so there's gamble there's a gamble there because in the end I, i'm as though the artist has, has laid out cash to obviously you know in in kind to put aside the time to make the works and there's material costs and so on and studio costs or whatever uh, the gallerist has his own um stuff to cover you know overheads mm -hmm. of gallery hire exhibitions catalogs invites brochures uh, postage, transport, framing, the whole works. So it's a case of looking at the looking at the gamble of the artist, because nothing is a surefire thing, you know, as we found out with COVID. You know what I mean? Nothing is a surefire thing. Looking mm -hmm. at the, the gamble and then deciding in relation to that gamble, the percentage um, cut. But mm -hmm. I don't think generally it's... Uh, I, I would never take more... Um, if working with an artist and taking on consignment, I would never take more than 50%. That would be my um, mm -hmm. max, I would say. But 60-40 um, but is normally the norm. And, and do you um, agree to work with an artist for a, a period of time? Or how does, how does that work? Yeah, the, when I started the gallery, I went to India um, and I saw must be about 50 artists over a few weeks, which I got down to 17 artists, which were my bread and kind of not my bread and butter, my starting blocks. And I used those artists in 2006 to kind of work out because I didn't know what my clientele would like. I didn't have a clientele yet. So mm -hmm. I used those artists to test the water. Um, I had some some. Mm. some work that was very surreal I had some that was very abstract I had some very traditional and over the last decade and a bit um, those artists have been my um, go-to marker points for my gallery and the way that the vision of it um, the the way that my net is cast in terms of artists that I bring in mm -hmm. um, so um, Sorry, I've, I've lost track of the question, but I, I basically I used those artists, those early artists to guide my future choices because they have continued to be good sellers for me. Mm -hmm. And so I look for artists to join that inner, inner circle group and build the collection cleverly, very strategically. That's my plan. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I've, I've, I've really enjoyed finding out about um, the artists that, that you work with, the, the be beautiful artworks, and the, uh, really interesting to hear you go into detail um, ab about their backgrounds, about what the stories that the artwork brings to the viewer. Um, it's, it's been a really fruitful presentation. Yes, and me. I never get to think about these things, so it's kind of nice to be forced to think about them and, you know, and uh, what I look for in artists, so thank you. Mm, thank you, Jenna, thanks. Um, I, th I think we need to bring it to a close now um, and uh, just also to say that we, we've got another artist presentation in two weeks time with uh, Liz Bentley who's a psychotherapist by day, comedian by night and Liz talks about her life as a therapist, writer and performer and explores how self-isolating is affecting her work, life and creativity. Um, that's in a couple of weeks' time. It's been lovely hearing about the Noble Sage. Thank and, you. Thanks uh, for having me. Um,
did you did you want to end on one last thing around about the noble sage and and um yeah well i was just going to say that if there are artists out there who are watching and who are south asian themselves they either have heritage from south asia or they are um from there living here um and they believe you know the gallery the noble sage might be a good platform for them do get in touch with me via email uh, with some low-res images uh biodata you know what you need now from the video load of <laughs> low-res images biodata and um and some uh, a website link if you can and then i can have a look at that i'll be happy to critique work or give you some feedback or and if possible see if i can work with you so do get in touch cheers thanks ever so much thanks colin thank you bye jana bye bye